Okay, not gonna lie, as a Frenchman talking about 1940 and how quickly we were defeated by Germans is the equivalent of a nice SNM session. But I guess at some point we need to have this conversation on my channel, so let's go and review the Armchairs Historian video on this topic. Is the French military so preoccupied with eating baguettes instead of fighting the Second World War? Uh, eating baguette, no, but they were drinking a lot of wine, that's for sure. And that's a fact. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. More on that later. The swift capitulation of France in 1940 is often attributed to a surprise attack through the Benelux and left at that. But fewer people take a moment to consider why the French were so vulnerable to a surprise attack in the first place. Today we'll be discussing three major reasons for France's defeat in 1940. Economic woes, increasing civilian control over the military, and a conservative military philosophy. We'll also evaluate German and French military equipment to decide whether the factor played a significant role in deciding the outcome of the clash between the two powers. Let's begin by evaluating the state of the French army from 1918 up until 1936, a period characterized by a gradual decline in French military prowess. Immediately after the First World War, France experienced a brain drain, with many rich, educated, and experienced officers resigning. This is not surprising since such things happen after every war, but the French seem to believe that a lasting peace was finally reached, with many genuinely trusting that the League of Nations could prevent future wars. Massive military budget cuts ensued and service training was gradually reduced from three years to just one year. These budget cuts were largely the result of it was, but this, the military service, service were, was uh, strengthened before World War I uh, to, to prepare the war. So it was from one year to three years, so now it's back to normal. ...of a dire economic situation. After the First World War, France was nearly bankrupt. And as a result of the Great Depression in the 1930s, it never really had the chance to recover. Just as the situation in France reached an all-time low, Germany was beginning to experience an upswing. Paul-Marie de la Gourse writes that, By 1936, the economic and financial situation of France had never been worse. These economic woes, compounded with Germany's resurgence as a major power, directly translated to France's sphere of influence diminishing as well. Check. Yeah, you have to, to see, just by looking at this map, you, see, you can see that after World War I, Germany is still a massive country, and their population is, uh, I guess, just before World War II, uh, twice, uh, twice bigger than the French one. I guess there are something like 80 million, and France in, is only 40 million due to its poor demographic. Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Yugoslavia, once allies and trade partners, now looked elsewhere. To make matters worse, the problems of the French military apparatus were exacerbated by the civilian sector's increasingly tight hold on the army and bureaucracy. This was the result of a political chasm between the extreme left-wing Popular Front and the center-right coalition, with both sides trying to secure as many military positions as possible to forestall the possibility of one using the military against the other. In short, loyalty was prized over competence, so it was the bureaucrats who got all the promotions. As a result of having a non-military bureaucracy, run by civilians with minimal military experience, and an absence of experienced generals, the French military philosophy was fundamentally flawed. Hey, I wouldn't say necessarily that the civilian government had uh a lot of power on the army because uh, for once these governments were never stable i mean we had dozens of uh, of changes of governments but i think that the the old army leaders uh, had too much influence on the army uh, 
And yes, I'm referring to Maréchal Pétain, but I guess we'll deal with him later. In the 1930s, the French constructed the Maginot Line on the Franco-German border oh, as part of its defensive strategy. But F.O. Miksha put it best, stating that the Maginot Line was a formidable barrier, not so much against the German army as against French understanding of modern war. The line was hailed as impenetrable, but it was impenetrable in the same way that the Titanic was unsinkable. It had weak spots, and in 1940, Hitler's force. I will say this, uh, and maybe I have an unpopular opinion uh, when it comes to the Maginot Line. And let me know if you think I'm wrong, and I'm willing to be to be wrong on this one. But for me. Um, the purpose of a fortification line is not to be impenetrable or invincible, uh, and the purpose of the Maginot line was never to hold indefinitely against the Germans. The purpose of a fortification line is to dissuade, dissuade and discourage uh, the enemy to directly strike to uh, to, uh, to directly attack this uh, this fortification. And uh, as for the Maginot, it perfectly uh, served his role. Uh, the Germans had to come up with another idea. Uh, so they were going to attack through Belgium. And the French high command was aware of that. So uh, they were planning to, to have a decisive battle in, uh, in the Belgium and Netherlands. And um, you also have one other argument which is uh, almost a meme on on internet is that, uh, yeah, why did we stop Magino and why didn't we extend it to the Belgium frontier? But the problem is, um, I will ask you this, how if you want to reassure the, the Belgians that you're going to defend them, what kind of message do you send them if you build, build up a concrete wall behind their border? Yeah, yeah, guys, don't worry, we're going to help you. And then you're building your fortification in your uh, border. That was uh, not, not possible. Forces were able to breach the line through the Ardennes forest, since the French were of the mistaken conviction that the rough terrain would deter any German tank attacks. Again, the problem lies with military philosophy. Standard military strategy states that, in order to win you need a superior force. The French interpreted this statement to mean that they needed superior strength across the whole front line. The Germans, on the other hand, focused on bolstering their strength at one or two carefully selected points, and then launching an aggressive attack, using fast, light vehicles, dive bombers, and fighters all in unison. Now that we've compared French and German military philosophies, and when they attack there, so in the Ardennes, the, the French army is so overstretched stretched, sorry, that uh, at this point, uh, the, the, um, the, the guys who were defending the Ardennes uh, area were like reserves. There were third grade units which were not uh, suited for combat and their task were only to, yeah, to occupy the, the area. So when the, you have the, the whole might of the Germans who's punching there, uh, they are going to be, they lack everything to, uh, to resist to, to them. Let's compare military equipment to come to a conclusion about the extent to which it decided a German victory. One can make the assertion that French infantry was in some ways superior to German infantry. Not only did the French have superior numbers and supply lines, but contrary to prevailing thought, it was more motorized and outfitted with modern equipment than the Wehrmacht. The, the only, uh, the only uh, place where really behind Germany is the, the aircraft and especially the Air Force, sorry, and especially the way to use it in a modern warfare. Theoretically, French armor should have also enjoyed an advantage over its German counterpart. The French Char B1 bis heavy tank was virtually impenetrable from the front, and the Soma S35 medium tank 
also had more durable armor than that of the German panzers. However, one could argue that Germany used its tanks more effectively. Yes. Germany's tank battalions were composed of independent, lightly armored tank divisions, and as previously discussed, their speed was harnessed to surprise the French. The Germans also employed wireless technology, each tank being equipped with radio receivers to relay and mobilize battalions at a pace that the French, who used flags instead of radios, simply couldn't match. So, um... I guess uh, this is an example of uh, this is a perfect example of uh, the, the mindset of the French high command. So uh, tanks using flags, but uh, the HQ was also um, reluctant, reluctant of using radios and telephone. So. Uh, they were using uh, telegrams by fear that Germans might intercept this, uh, these messages. And sometimes they were even using freaking pigeons to carry out their orders. So as a result, uh, by the time these uh, message messages reached the, the front, uh, they are always, uh, you know, uh, they are not relevant anymore. And it's like it's like in the in, in the downfall when uh, Mustacheman asks uh, Steiner to to counterattack. It's almost the same situation. And as for the air forces of both countries, the French Armée de la Air was at a disadvantage numerically, yep. despite high levels of French aircraft production. This is because the French had very few spare parts for their aircraft, and consequently could neither prepare or repair their planes for service as fast as the Germans. Still, French fighters generally outperformed their German foes, with two German fighters being down for every one French fighter. Overall, we can see that France held a slight advantage when it came to their military equipment, but a poor military philosophy completely negated this advantage. It should not come as a surprise that this faulty military philosophy was upheld when one remembers the brain drain we discussed previously. At a fundamental level, what the French lacked was imagination, innovation, and a willingness to learn from the First World War. The French were rudely awakened from a dream of peace that lasted just a bit too long, having fallen asleep under the false sense of security provided to them by the League of Nations. Okay, so uh, when it comes to philosophy and coming back to, uh, to, to Maréchal Pétain uh, and the brain drain, so what happens is uh, Maréchal Pétain uh, and guys who back him uh, have so much prestige and have such a strong image in France after World War I that uh, he, he gets very, very influential and imposes its, its views uh, and the, the guy who are going to command the army after, uh, after him are going to be his sort of disciples here, uh, second in commands, for example, the, the Generalissimo Gamelin. Problem is that uh, first, um, and here also unpopular opinion, uh, maybe, but Maréchal Pétain was never a militaristic genius. He was a competent officer during World War One. He held, he performed very well in, uh, in Verdun which obviously gained him so much prestige. But he was, uh, he, he was a pessimistic guy, a defeatist guy, and for example, the perfect example is that uh, he was never chosen as the generalissimo of the, of the Triple Entente in World War I. General Foch was. Uh, and the problem is that uh, Pétain has still a lot of influence in World War II, is going to impose its view uh, before that, and as a consequence, yeah, we're going to, to lag one, to, to, yeah, to lag one year war behind in 1940. Okay, as a conclusion, I'd, I'd like to, to have a quick words about the, the, about the actual soldiers of the French army, so, 
I think that, uh, and that applies for us as French, uh, we have been really unfair to them because um, we never talk about them, but they fought very bravely with courage. And we also even um, so have a lot of uh, examples of officers who took they, their own lives um, out of desperation when the armistice was signed. Uh, that's that's to, to say that, yeah, they were willing to defend their country. You can see it at, at Dunkirk, for example. Um, and these soldiers so went into captivity in Germany. They stayed there for five years. And when they came back, they were the army of losers uh, who were so easily defeated by the Germans. And so, yeah, they were uh, met, welcomed with some kind of shame. And I think that it's unfair for these guys. So, yeah, I will leave you on that. Um, see you soon and take care. Bye.